to commas. Commas is all things tech. Culture and technology coming together. Life hacks. The practicality right now in the inefficiency of the internet of buying and selling stuff is extraordinary. Entrepreneurship advice. I think the first thing is you got to understand your business inside out. Love and tech. We've almost reduced dating to kind of this very momentary snap of a person. It's going to be a fire show. I have yet to see something these days that's truly differentiated. New advice and new inspiration every show. It really is about the next generation of creators going faster, further than we did. And now, Sequoia Blodgett. Now let's start stacking them commas. On this episode, we're going to discuss the importance of ownership with Jeremy and Bryce, co-founders of Cover 360, and I'm going to explain to you why it's actually your ticket to financial freedom. Entrepreneurship advice. <laughs> Learn from the hottest and most successful investors, founders, and innovators in the game. Determine your greatness. It's time to get your knowledge up. Okay, okay, for sure, for sure. What is popping, you guys? We have it. Jeremy and Bryce in the building today. We are, Ooh. hey. Yeah. What's up? Yeah. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Today we're going to talk about ownership, but I want you guys to yes. really like just dive into your backgrounds first, just so everybody is familiar with who you are. So Let's what go is you. good? Let's go from north to the south, or south north, to the north, 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 north to the south. All right. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Um, I'm Bryce, you know, independent artist, you know, creator and um, philanthropist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm from the Bronx, like I said. Uh, I do music. BX. Um, BX, BX. <laughs> you already know. But yeah, man, um, you know, a kid from trouble who just changed his path. Love it. Jeremy, what's good? Jeremy, Jeremy, Jeremy. Yep, that's me. Um, from North Carolina originally, but reside in Washington, D.C. for the last 20 some years. Um, you know, grew up in rural South, saw a lot of trouble, um, tried to find ways to escape, uh, ended up. You know, getting into the military, didn't really like that too much. Um, landed in D.C. and uh, got into music and producing and sound engineering and ultimately got into computer science and uh, developed a lot of systems. And now I take my knowledge and I share it with the world by creating, you know, opportunities for young independent creators and entrepreneurs, especially kids. I love the kids. Um, love the kids. Yep. Own a nonprofit organization that teach kids STEM, and uh, that's how we rock it. That's what's up. And how did you guys meet? Well, we met um, at the radio. At the radio, something really? very yeah, similar to this. Yeah. Yep. You know, if you if you know Jeremy, what you get to know Jeremy, he doesn't talk a lot. I don't you talk know, a lot. But he comes in there and then, you know, you kind of be like, who's this in the room? And then, <laughs> and then you figure it out and you'd be like, oh, what's up, Jeremy? And yeah. then, you know, organically we built it and now here we are today. What radio station was this? Uh, we was at uh, 95.5 in Washington, D.C., um, a CBS uh, I was, radio station. I was ironically uh, pushing my single independently. Yep. What's the single? Well, it was a single that was distributed through Rock Nation called Do No Wrong featuring T.I. and Young Dro. Nice. Yeah. It was a dope song. Yeah. And, and that, so, go ahead. No, I was saying, at the time, um, I was actually uh, doing a lot of philanthropy stuff with my nonprofit organization. Um, I had took Brashear Gray, which is from... Fox Empire, we was going to different um, uh, boys and girls clubs, teaching STEM, talking about arts and culture. And I met Bryce, who was a young, uh, influential person. And uh, I was telling him about the new network that I was uh, about to build, which is Cover 360, the company. And uh, he was interested. And so we just started collaborating and talking. It was real organic. It's been a couple of years ago now. So tell us more about the network that you guys are building. Well, from my standpoint, um, like you said, organically, uh, he uh, pitched to me the idea about um, creating opportunities for independent people and being a brand ambassador. And I was like, well, it's pretty dope, but I would like to do my research, understand where and what aspect are we coming from and approach are we taking to make this very, very responsive. And um, today, as we are app developers, well, <laughs> with Apple, yeah. Google, and we partner with Microsoft I'm a, as a brand ambassador to uh, help create opportunities to creators and put the power back in the creator's hands because it's all about your skill. And if you got skill, then you are the commodity. That's a fact. Dope. And you guys talked about ownership. So tell us about how you're helping these artists leverage ownership of their own brands. Well, first of all, you know, just I went around the world, you know, and I got STEM schools all around the world. And I would ask kids, 
um, do you know what intellectual property is? And most people didn't really know what intellectual property was. Um, even school teachers, they didn't know what intellectual property was. And um, I found that very like, wow, you know what I mean? Um, so I started to realize that people don't really understand the power of ownership just because they don't really even understand that they themselves, like Bryce said, is a commodity, you know, and you'd be able to produce um, through your hard work and, you know, developing yourself through self, um, you know, education and stuff like that and being creative. And you're putting all this creative intellectual property on social media, on platforms, YouTube and all these things that, you know, some of them pay and some of them don't. Right. And they don't realize that, you know, you might create something dope here in America, but somebody in Nigeria or France or Italy actually pay for that. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And um, you got both multi-billionaires um, and our counter racists, you know what I mean, or counterparts that really understand that and they capitalize on that. And you see them because they have billion dollar uh, profit uh, making or revenue generating you know, companies. And they're in their 20s, you know, when they're doing that, they're billionaires. And we don't have that. You know what I mean? The entertainment industry itself, not even arts and culture as a whole, is a multi-billion dollar industry that we get a very small percentage of. So to be able to take my knowledge and my understanding of that over the last you know, 15, 20 years I've been in technology and the entertainment world and to be able to teach that and teach ownership and teach entrepreneurship and put it in a platform where these creative um, minds can come together and collaborate and learn about being a venture capitalist, learn about how to raise money for themselves through friends and families and things of that nature and be able to have a brand and cultivate that brand and grow that brand and actually become a commodity for that brand, your name itself, and then spread that brand throughout the world. And with, you know, three, four billion people um, actually on the internet and being able to exchange through different types of currency uh, platforms like Cash App and YouTube, I mean, PayPal and things of that nature, you can make money all over the world. So we want to redistribute that thought process into the urban communities, you know what I mean? So they can become owners again um, of their intellectual property and their creative brand. That's dope. Bryce, when you stepped into the music scene, did you think about signing to a major or were you like, yo, I'm going to stay independent and just own my rights flat out? Man, I ain't going to lie. I was reaching for signing with a major. You were like, right, yeah, yeah. I was, I was reaching well, like, yo, good. like, yeah, I need some help. I need to be <laughs> on MTV, Music Awards, the Grammys, all that. I know that you have the budgets and the outlets, but am I going to be able to own what I create? And when I step back and look from that standpoint, I've always been a guy that is like my skill will drive me farther than and my work ethic will drive me farther than the eye can see. Like when I was a little kid, I used to pack bags at the store just to hustle with my own money to get the new Jordans every week. So I'll probably make $100 a week doing my own thing without having to pay nobody else, answer to nobody else and on my own time. So, so with that mind frame, I kind of thought like if I could do that as a little kid, then with my mind and experience from being around industry professionals and being around hot producers and, and artists that I've seen their flaws, why not learn from their mistakes and enhance my own journey? I think that's a dope point that you make because I think a lot of, especially our culture, we look at the popularity and the vanity, especially yeah. being artists. And even influencers are like, oh, we want to, we want the numbers, we want the numbers, but like that's not ownership, right? Yeah, that's not. Like, so when you went, did you go and like shop to labels, or were you just like, like at what point did you say I don't want to do it that way? Um, at one point did I say that? Uh, you <laughs> like I haven't. <laughs> uh, I have, I have said it. Okay, but, yeah. uh, it's, it's just it came to probably, I thought about it a lot once I started not reaping the benefits. By chasing them you know what I mean when I started chasing them I was losing more because I was losing who I was and how I was trying to be and make sure my journey is fit into how I carry myself and chasing a label and doing all that stuff you lose yourself like you know what I mean you'll be out there trying to fit in the trends and stuff but then you'll look in the mirror and be like that's not who I am you know what I mean so now I feel very I feel very like my quest is like unique because I am me and I embody this whole thought process. And it's like, that's why when me and Jeremy met, it wasn't just like, let's jump into this. Let's just get to work. I wanted to figure out if it fit me. You know what I mean? If it was who I am. Like J. Cole said, an artist that I look up to, you only have 24 hours in a day. 
So if you work in eight hours, you got to sleep eight hours, then you have the rest just to be free and be you. But if you cut that down and you have more time to sleep and more time to be who you are, then it's all about your thought process and all about your hustle to make your results. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think a lot of people forget that the music industry is a business. Yeah. Right? So when they look at you, they're looking at you as like, how can we package you commercially? How can we sell? How can we leverage you? How can we you? sell you? Yeah, yeah. literally. Yeah. Like, you are the product. <laughs> yeah, and so I think a lot of people forget that. And, like, now, given the dynamics of digital and where we've gone, you can literally package and sell Yourself. your own content. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's what you guys are doing. So Absolutely. tell us about some of the artists you guys have been working with and, like, how you've been growing this brand. Oh, man, one of the most successful things we've done now is we partnered with, uh, we're starting to partner with HBCUs. Um, we did a major event at Bowie State University where we took over their whole Fine Performing Arts Center um, and we molded the minds for a whole day of about 300 creative artists. Um, we created a platform for them to perform. We had um, Angela Yee from The Breakfast Club um, mentoring. We had uh, Turbo the Great, who's now a platinum producer, um, who's you know very influential in the music industry. We had uh, T.I., uh, who came and also mentored that day, and then a host of just other people, my, including myself, um, and Bryce was there, you know what I mean? And the whole day was just an amazing thing to be able to sit there and really feed them what they wanted, but more so let them ask us real intimate questions about you know our intellectual property and how we were able to develop what we now call our brands and our platforms and our businesses and how we grew that. And to be able to pour into those uh, young minds and young creative people gave me the inspiration like, yeah, this is what I really want to do. And to also know I came from that struggle, right? You know what I mean? Um, of wanting to have my own platform, have my own say, if you will, and ownership of what embody who I am and then give that back to the world. Um, and it's a dope thing. So, What were some of those questions that you got that you were like, oh, <laughs> One question that I thought stood out out of, uh, out of all the questions is this one young um, gentleman, he asked um, Angela, so Angela, you have, you know, millions of people following you, but you only follow, I think she was following like a thousand, maybe over a thousand people. How do a young man like me, who is in the millions of people that you don't follow, how do I get your attention? Mm. You know what I mean? And I thought that was a very dope question and right. the way she answered it. Now, the cool thing about it is, our app has all of this broken up into different segments of different topics. So inside the app is not only just um, opportunities that you can submit to, it's also the actual uh, workshops and classes and the content that you can actually learn from. Mm. Um, you can actually get advice. You can chat with us. We can get real industry. Because the thing is, is the industry is made up of people. You know what I mean? Right. And if you can bring those people to a platform that can actually share um, with the independent creators out there on in a real time basis, and everybody wins. The members of our platform are actually earning, learning, and then the people that are creating it for our platform will buying the content from them. So everybody is winning in that situation, and we as a company is winning because you know we're able to share um, in a in a creative community all of this intellectual property that they can learn how to become owners and learn how to create and, and develop um, their own communities. And you said you don't just work with artists. So who are some of the other people that you guys work with? Um, so me, I work with all types of people, um, <laughs> political people, um, writers, actors, uh, comedians. Um, we work with a lot of people because um, right now in this digital world that we live in, it's all about content. And content, a lot of people describe it in different ways, but at the end of the day, it's all the aesthetics and a vivid um imagery and you know music and and everything that goes into you know bringing a person into your own personal space and sharing with them so um that's what we're really into um because content is king it drives the digital age right now and so we're really shopping and looking for dope content um and want to want to share that with the world dope and is this a collective of everybody's audience or does each individual person have their own audience through your platform? It's a collective of everybody audience. So we're really pushing out to, so when you join cover 360, my network becomes Bryce network. I like this. Your network. This just becomes got real interesting. Yeah, it's kind of great. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we're pushing that content out to a collective body. So if let's just say 
Chance the Rapper, quote unquote, not saying it is or not, is in our network, then that content that we purchase and that we like gets pushed to Chance the Rapper. You see what I'm saying? So it's a collective body of uh, our network. And that's one of the benefits of joining Cover 360, joining our platform. You get to, you know, pitch your content to a collective body of people. And um, then you got us as the uh, number one influencers influencing our peers that that's on our level saying, yes, this is dope. But then you also got, you know, the cash for must buying the content from you if it's, you know, that dope. And what do those numbers look like? As far as what we are willing to purchase for content? It does. Uh, hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> got money in the bank. <laughs> Shorty, what you hey. think? <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's all we gonna say on that one, you know. All right, all right. I mean, if it generates the views and it generates, our whole thing is bringing people into our creative space mm-hmm. and being able to then redistribute the wealth back to the creators. And we give thirty three percent of all the, the revenue that we generate from Cover Three Hundred and Sixty back to creative artists. There is no platforms doing that right now, and the reason why we can do it is because we own the platform. You know what I mean? Me and Bryce literally, you know, from me, from a technical standpoint of view, I've built some major systems in the world. And, um, you know, a couple of them is GPS and cell phones. I helped build the information technology infrastructure for that. Um, also, the digital passport. Um, I've built some major platforms um, and I've worked with some major entertainers. Bryce being who he is, a super creative, you know, he's humble, but he's a very creative, powerful person and a very smart business person too as well and young not to forget you so he really can bridge the gap between you know the young millennial generation to where we are right now in the digital age so they can understand the power of owning their intellectual property and then putting those two collaborative forces together because we gel really well together like clowning around all the time and we can really bring this platform and bring this excitement to the entire world you know i have a business in nigeria right now um and i was out there with the president of Nigeria uh, a couple of years ago, you know, talking to kids, um, uh, STEM schools, they're very interested in doing music and, you know, working in technology and to be able to bring a Bryce or another young creative artist and ex- share the experience, you know what I mean? Whether it be virtually or we physically go there and do shows and do showcases in all these different worlds and bring these collaborative forces together. And then we're teaching people how to collaborate and how to bring unity into the world and also make money. So, <laughs> that's the main thing. That's the, that you know what I mean? So that's to me is I mean, of course I'm biased, but at the end of the day, I mean it's dope. I wish I had something like that, you know, when I got started 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. How are you guys different from Patreon? From who? Patreon. I never heard of that. So yeah. Patreon is a platform that now influencers can basically get on board and then you can have subscribers who pay you directly, right? So Essentially, before you could have like a YouTube account, and then mm-hmm. YouTube would pay you through your, your commercials, your ads, whatever. Now, Patreon actually, I think YouTube is kind of adopting this same principle, but Patreon allows you to create your audience or leverage your audience, and then your audience could subscribe to your content. So, is your audience on anything, or is it just music? Whoever your where, whoever your audience oh, is. Okay. So, if I'm an influencer, I go on Patreon, I upload my content, and then your audience could pay for my content directly. So, I'm essentially getting paid through my audience. And see, that's and that's cool, right? That's the traditional way, but we're reverse engineering that whole thought process. Number one is before you even worry about you have to worry about getting a audience, we're paying you for the content. That's number one. I like so, that. So yeah. if, you build, <laughs> if you build something, we're respecting you saying, yeah, you could go put your music on a whole bunch of different platforms and try to build an audience. Okay. Or I could say, that's really dope. I already have a platform that's going to like it. Let me give you $1,000 for that. I just want to have some naming rights. So so my you know brand's in the lower third. You're still going to get all your royalties. We don't want to own your stuff. We just want you to redirect and help bring you know subscribers to our network. And we're going to pay you for that. And not only that, if you bring subscribers to our network, you have a share code that's in the redirect. And you'll get one third of the actual subscription. So you're getting paid in Two different times. Yeah, so many different, yeah. And it's residual. So every time so if you bring a thousand people to our network and those thousand people stay on our network every month and pay our membership, which is two ninety nine, you get one dollar of that every month as like a creative it. artist. I like it. Can't be so <laughs> it's, it's really geared towards empowering. And then not only that, you're submitting content to it. Not only are you getting that thousand dollars from your subscribers, 
from your the people that you're bringing onto your network to our network that still have all the rights to get all the stuff that's within the creative cloud itself, which is the the books, the videos. The, they can submit to opportunities and that's the, those fashion. So you're getting paid and you're empowering your creative network on that regard. And also, we're still purchasing content from you. This is interesting. So what do you think the major players are going to do about this? Because obviously you're disrupting a lot of different networks. Right? Who are the major players? We're the disruptors. Yeah. Right, right. We are the disruptors. Right. So like looking at companies like a YouTube or a Facebook or an Instagram right. where basically they're leveraging your audience, right? Yep. Yeah. So essentially when you go on and you create a million followers on Instagram, you don't have ownership of those followers. That's right. right? Yeah, you don't. So how do you guys think that how you guys going to play against that? Like, well, it's so crazy that I we're ready it. for the battle and we love it. Yes. And it's, <laughs> like, yeah, the right thing right about it up. is, like, to go back on the label thing. So once I realized that the label was all about selling and you, you're, they're selling you, yeah. I realized that there are so many different type of major corporations out here that have budgets that allocate funds to stuff and there are no people to claim them. So I always wanted to sign to, like, a Verizon or... Some people to have the the mass the mass like how Jay Z did with Sprint and Title, mm -hmm. but now we created our own, so it's like already we're already partnered with Microsoft, with uh, Boohoo Man, uh, Champion, and Trilla. And so, all they, so basically, if you can't beat them, join them. So they're trying to get yeah. in bed with you guys at this point. Yeah, right. exactly, <laughs> exactly. And the crazy thing is, and I, I'm I'm sorry, I gotta toot my own horn a little bit, and Bryce, you know. <laughs> 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 but the way we present our creative artists is like the stock market because they are commodities. OK, so their profile looks something like um, a stock ticker. You know what I mean? It's showing their current activity, what they look like as a digital brand online, um, if they're emerging or established or major artists, um, all the, the real um, getting down to the granular thought process of who these people creative artists will most likely fit in the market with, whether it be a champion or Foot Locker or whatever. And we're enticing these brands, like Bryce said, to sponsor these artists because they have this following. They have this micro following that will actually listen to what they say. And so it's better to take a million dollars and give it to a thousand people than give a million dollars to one person. And mm -hmm. that's what we're influencing these Microsofts, these champions, these other major industries that are now flirting with us. And they're starting to really understand what we're saying because the power is in the numbers. Yeah. How big is the platform now? Um, right now we have we launched we, we did on our pre-launch and just building a network or whatever. We have about 30 some thousand you know, followers right now. Nice. And what type of artists or creatives are on there? Oh man, we got rock Very. bands. <laughs> we got the dope pe comedians, painters. painters, artists, graphics people from all over the world. France, Nig I mean, even when we did um, Bowie State University, man, we had people come from all over. Man, we had people come from out west, Nova we Scotia. People, yes, we had people come from it's all crazy, over. Crazy, right? <laughs> somebody, somebody came from France um, over to the showcase. Um, well, it wasn't really a showcase; it was an arts and culture fair. Nope, and your platform powered that. Yes, we pay. For, yep. you know, we we empower that. We funded the whole thing. Um, that's the cool thing about the platform. The reason why we can do this is because you know Bryce got the big bank. That's how you do it. Right there. Wow. <laughs> 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 yeah, funny right there. <laughs> oh man! Bryce, remember you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Oh, to go talk to Rock Nation after all. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good question. Do you guys plan on actually financing, like getting like VC behind this, or is this like bootstrapped, or what's your plan? Honestly, we've been offered, you know, but you know, to me, I want to follow the Mark Zuckerberg model, right? And the Larry Page model. I don't want to sell until I know what I have. Right. You know what I mean? Or I don't want to flirt really with a lot of offers because then offer come with opinion. Right? Yeah. Talk about it. <laughs> you know yeah, what I'm saying? Talk about it. Double O, offer opinion. No, yeah. we don't want the opinion. Yeah. And um I feel like me and Bryce and the team that we've assembled together organically over the last twenty some months. Um this is not my first rodeo, you know, okay. as far as building platforms for major labels and entertainers. So I'm pretty experienced and Bryce is not his first rodeo of dealing with entertainers on you know, major, major, major scales. 
And he's been modest. Bryce has been in movies. He's yeah, been Bryce, short films. tell us about you. I mean, you got to show time to shine. He, he always I mean, trying to play you know, the shy guy, well, but wait till you wait, see. He got up in here. Like, he got up in here. He has like, viral videos. Bryce yeah. is out there, man. He, he was like, Jeremy, don't talk. But Bryce hasn't said anything. So tell us about it. I'm curious. Oh, man. I have, like I said, man, I have viral videos. He took the words out of my mouth. Uh, I have a project out that is called Eternal Youth. It's on all the digital platforms. It's Brought me to this relevancy right here. I have songs with Meek Mills, uh, T.I., uh, Cap G. Um, I've been in the studios with Kanye West, uh, Pharrell, and all the up-and-coming, emerging, major influencers that are in this industry, from producers and all of that. And you know what? That was my thing also. I never wanted to be a burden on nobody. Mm. I never wanted to feel like just because my peers are in a position to win, that I'm obligated to get put on by them. You know what I mean? I was always meet you at the top, salute. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and revolutionize everything because I am not an opportunist. I like to create opportunity. So Amen. I would like people to create opportunity for me also. But in order to do that, you have to be moving. You have to keep on thriving. And right. yeah. that's what's up. So, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, yeah, Bryce is just <laughs> you know, when I when I met him. He just had this ambition and willing willingness to learn. Um, I pitched something to him. He's like, uh, "Sounds dope, but I don't know. Let me think about that." <laughs> <laughs> and I like that. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Because I was like, "Yeah, that's that's exact, that's exactly right." You One of the mean? craziest things though that Jeremy did was like, um, I have a friend that is a billionaire, mm-hmm. and we were working on pitching something to him to get a budget. Mm-hmm. He was like, "Yo, I mean, that's cool, but I could." Show you how to get more money than that. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, huh? Okay. Show well, me. I'm definitely up and my ears are open. You know what I mean? I Even- was basically telling him, look, man, you, you're you the commodity. You're creating this content. You are you have this intellectual property. That's why Bryce is a, the perfect business partner because he's also, you know, uh, in, in my mind, you know, I show him what this digital platform could really be. Yeah. And took what he was already doing and digitized it, really. And that's what I was telling him. Like, you could sell out for X, Y, Z dollars and you're going to be like getting all these opinions and people trying to control you. And now you're under this stress. You can't create like that. Or you can understand what I'm trying to tell you about this digital platform and owning your own brand and being a commodity and bringing your own audience to a, you know, a private space that they'll actually give you pennies on a dollar. But those pennies on a dollar add up when you do it times thousands. You know what I mean? So that same money that you're going to sell out for, you can create the same intellectual property and exclusive content that you're doing, drive it to an independent platform, and you can make that every month that you're about to sell out to. And so that's where we are. <laughs> that's, why like, Bright okay, got, that's why he got the big bank right here. <laughs> where do the I big, sign? The biggest thing that I learned <clears throat> is to not become desperate. That's what's up. When you become desperate, you start making all type of wrong moves. Yeah. And that is key. I agree with that 100%. 100%. So what advice would you give to folks out there? Because I know we talked about ownership kind of briefly, but the underlining theme is ownership, right? So what advice would you give to folks out there who maybe aren't creatives, who probably aren't a fit for the platform, but like... I think for us in particular, our community, we need to be embracing ownership. So what are some of those tips that you would give people? I would say figure out your strong points. And go do the background stuff before you even go and promote what you have. Like, go get an LLC. Go ahead and write a blueprint. Write your uh, your um, exit plan. You know what I mean? Figure out who you are. And before you just go ahead and throw away and sell out and just let people claim your prize. Because every nobody thinks alike. We all have different DNA. Right. So everybody has a different scale. They just have to tap in and figure it out. <laughs> and own whatever that is. Yeah. Like create, <laughs> you have to. Figure out how to create and make it a business and own that. Definitely. Right? Yeah. Definitely own it. Me, um, I'm always going to think very logically as it relates to first get a skill. Then understand the value of that skill. Once you understand the value of that skill, look at your target market and understand how to offer that skill to your target market. And once you understand that, then build a blueprint, which is a a plan, have a plan. Um, A lot of people don't understand that you can get paid for having a plan. If you got a dope plan, somebody give you money. It's called venture capitalists. (laughs) They're called venture capitalists, angel investors, and 
friends and family, all that type of stuff, right? So first, you know, that's what I would offer up, like Bryce said, pretty much the preliminary stuff. You know, just un- own your own skill, know what that is, know who your target market is, create your plan, and then start building your intellectual property and your brand around who you really are, your own uniqueness and what you offer to the world. That's what's up. I think a lot of people, you know, obviously in this day and age, ownership is key, but not everybody's an entrepreneur, right? So what are other ways that you would say that you should be leveraging that ownership if you're not an entrepreneur? Be a team player. You know what I mean? Help the person who has the vision. Don't settle for greed. You know what I mean? A lot of people would be like... Oh, my God, that is... <laughs> the black community. Well, oh black people will crab we'll in the barrel together. mentality. You know yes. what I'm saying? Do not let him out. He got an idea. Yeah. But that idea could just revolutionize everything. Like, look at Nipsey Hussle. Like, even though he had his past and all that, he studied and tapped into his origins and figured out who he was and then embraced that, embodied that, and came back and was one with his home, with his home city. And they loved and respected him, as you can see through the unfortunate events. Right, right. Yep. That's what's up. I totally agree, man. It's just like <clears throat> you got to be able to just own your own uniqueness. I mean, that's that's what I had to learn. I mean, if I if I could go back and do it all over again, I wouldn't because now I see every mistake, every learning. I mean, it all just became uniquely who I am. Mm-hmm. And now when I when you embrace that, that becomes confident. And then when you, like I said, have a skill that match that, you know, and you can just speak on it and own it, you don't want to give it to nobody else. And you want to get paid for owning it. <laughs> That's what's up. You know what I'm That's real. I think a lot of emphasis in our community has been p- placed on the dollar in the wrong way, right? I think the dollar is the exchange of value. Mm. So when you have, yeah, like when you have value, you're going to get the money. Absolutely. Right? So yeah. push the value. Yep. It's the end result of power. It is the end result of power. <laughs> <laughs> That's and that's what a lot of people don't understand. The, the actual capitalistic system, you know, if we want to start talking about how it was formed, the original people were against it because they said labor, you know what I mean, was the most powerful, you know, commodity. Because labor. without the labor, you have no commodities, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And it was really based on bartering, you know what I mean, skill for skill. And then, you know, some people got greedy and they want to create capitalism, you know what I mean? They want to own things and... And then they didn't want to teach other people how to own those things, but take it from them, you know, and copyright and, and take it, you know. And so this world was built on that. So if we can reverse engineer that thought early in the young minds, instead of going to schools and asking them what intellectual property is and they say no, they we go to schools and we ask them what intellectual property is and they say my thoughts, my ideas, everything that belong to me that I want to own and sell to the rest of the world because I am the commodity. That's what I want to hear young children say. That's why a lot of people are dropping out also. Yep. Because school is not teaching that. And everybody is hip to, uh, you can make money doing your own thing without school. Yeah. Listen, I it, one day it just like dawned on me because I was talking to some folks and I was like, you really ain't got to be smart to be rich. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, you really don't. Yeah. $150,000 of education later. <laughs> well, hold up, damn it. Sally May. Sally <laughs> May. Yeah, right? Yeah, man. <laughs> like, how do I get on her team? Come on, yo. All right, but that's a whole other conversation for yeah. another day. Yep. <laughs> but um, so tell us how to find you guys. I'm on Instagram. At B Official MG, B E Official MG. That's my B Official Management Group is the management company that I own that holds all my assets and is uh, really the owner of Cover 360 along with Bryce's company, Nocturnal Vortex. Um, you can reach me at, at B Official MG, but the company we're speaking on at Cover 360, C O V E R 360 I X T Y at Cover 360. You can reach me at G-F-M-B-R-Y-Y-C-E, G-F-M Bryce. Bryce is my artist name. I have a website out that's called Being Bryce. You could go look me up, all my latest shows and everything, new music. I have a project out called Eternal Youth that is streaming very well on all platforms, and I have a new project on the way. He has platinum songs on plat- on Spotify. <laughs> well, wait, that, listen, that could open up a whole other conversation because I haven't been seeing those wars about Whoa. like all the type of royalties that they ain't paying, but whatever. <laughs> <All right. laughs> and that's why we're here. That's definitely why we're here. <laughs> 
So as you guys know, Commas is more than just a podcast or a radio show. We're an actual community. And I just want to shout out our community members because that's super important. So we had a woman come in about six, seven weeks ago. And essentially when she came in, she was $50,000 in debt actually from paying somebody to build out her mobile platform for her. And this guy just like ran off with her money and gone and never to be seen again. So I would have been like scared or, you know, a little nervous about investing more money, but she wasn't. She was ready to go. She had embraced the fact that that was a wash and she was ready to invest in herself all over again. So she trusted commas and we basically took her through the entire process of understanding how to target the market, how to validate her customer and how to build out a minimum viable product so she could take that product to market and start onboarding customers. And she did that. She completed everything within eight weeks tops. She's now an official Commas Club VIP member, and I'm just super excited to see her progress and where she started and where she is now. So shout out to Paulina for taking that jump and trusting us. So if you guys want that help, we are an amazing community that you should definitely join. Check us out at commasthiseries.com or on our Instagram at commasthiseries. It's life hacks. Life hacking, baby. Tech tips and tools for everyday needs. Tap in. Control copy these shortcuts and simplify your life. You heard us. Piggybacking off of the conversation we had earlier with Jeremy and Bryce, we're going to talk about financial freedom and ownership. And so before we get into that, let's define ownership. Ownership is the act, state, or right of possessing something. Something, right. And I want to take that one step further and add to that, that one thing or that thing is assets that you can liquidate that provides financial value. And that's the type of ownership that I want to focus on during this segment. One of the books that I found very interesting is by Jason Kabler, and it's Debt Versus Ownership, How to Create an Ownership Mentality. So a lot of us were brought up with a debt based mentality. Our thought process behind that is debt was a thing that we should incur, right? We were given credit cards, loans in college were a form of debt, right? And so with that being said, I think debt, and Jason says this in the book, is a false prosperity. We're constantly encouraged through tons of marketing messages. Like I said, when we're in college, when we go to college, all these things of why we should get into debt and why debt is a good thing. And, you know, they're telling us we have easy monthly payments and it sounds like a convenient option because we don't have the money at the time. And it's just things that we're encouraged to do, right? But there are some serious stressors and downsides of debt that we don't understand going into it. One is just the stress itself, right? You're constantly thinking, where's my money coming from? Where's my next paycheck coming from? And that's one of the big stressors of actually being in debt. You're in financial bondage because you owe somebody, right? Or you own a corporation or you own the government. You owe somebody. So you're seriously financially bonded to them until you can actually pay off that debt. And that causes severe types of anxiety, especially when you have bill collectors calling you all the time asking for their money when you may not have the funds or the resources to pay off those bills. And then paying more for things than what you actually should be paying for them, right? So you go, you purchase a car, the car could cost X amount of dollars, like the sticker price could be like $20,000. And by the time you pay off this car, it's like $35,000, right? So those are some of the downsides that, you know, obviously having debt incur. And The biggest one is living paycheck to paycheck, right? You always feel like you're on this hamster wheel and you're never getting off the cycle. It's like you're just going and going and going and going, but you're never, ever free, right? And so that's one of the big things that we incur when we go into debt. And the thing is, debt is actually not, it's a, like I said, a false prosperity. Like it's a, it's a lie. Like we don't need to have debt right? We should actually be thinking of it from a ownership perspective. So how do you reverse that mentality? How do you shift? It's a small shift, a small adjustment. 
How do you shift that mentality so you're thinking about debt in terms of ownership? So when you have ownership, the perspective completely shifts. So it's just like I talked about earlier. It's the polar opposite. So you never have to spend more money than you have because you're paying in cash. You have so much less stress. You have less financial risk in your life. You're not a slave to the system. So you're not constantly stressing about how you're going to pay back the government, how you're going to pay back the banks, how you're going to pay back you know, whoever it is that you borrowed from and you're free. You're, you're essentially financially free, right? And so that just means your life has just a much better existence. Like you just feel better going about your day because you're not stressed about all of these things that being in debt can stress you out from, right? And so how do you have that ownership mentality? Well, there are a couple of things that you can do in order to switch over from having that debt-based mentality to that ownership mentality. And one of those things is just get rid of your credit cards, right? Have an emergency fund. So if you don't have an emergency fund, you usually go to the credit card and you charge the credit card. And that's essentially what's, what gets you, you know, what you need to do. Or if you do have a credit card, Make sure you only have that one credit card that you are consistently paying off so you can build your credit, but don't use that credit card for things that you can't afford. So don't think about this being money that you have because you actually don't have it, right? So think about that credit card as being something that you can pay into to build credit instead of replacing the money that you don't have, right? Building out that emergency fund, making sure you have an emergency fund that has a substantial amount of money in it. So when things do hit the fan, because things will hit the fan, that's just how life works. You do have money that you can then pay out of that emergency fund and then just focus very heavily on getting out of debt. So that means paying off any old credit cards, paying off any student loans that you have, paying off whatever it is. If it's, you know, an excess amount of like a car payment, pay that off and just Don't live above your means, right? Like try to focus on living beneath your means and then really focus on growing that top of the line number, right? So if you're making $70,000, but your cost of living is $75,000, then you have to get to yourself to $75,000. If you're making $70,000 and your cost of living is $65,000 and you're in a good space, you can save that $5,000, right? And then you can start to, Put that toward an emergency fund. You can start to invest that money. So just make sure that you're always living beneath your means versus trying to spend money that you don't actually have. And so just ask yourself, like, what type of mindset you have? Do you have that ownership mindset or do you have that debt-based mindset? And then how do you change that? Like, why do you have that mindset? And then work very diligently to adjust that mindset. So some of the ways that you can also have ownership is making sure that you're building a business. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're really comfortable with working for yourself and like building up a company, have ownership of that company. I think people don't understand when they bring on investors that that ownership starts to dilute. So you want to keep as much as you can up until the point of you needing to scale and then bring on those investors if it's imperative to your company, because a lot of companies, especially small, medium businesses, don't necessarily need venture to grow and scale the company. So if you are a large tech-based company or some a company that does need venture, then of course you're going to dilute, which is fine because your valuation is going to go up based off the investors who are investing in the company. So that's not a big deal. But if you are a small, medium business, try to keep ownership of that business if you can, because obviously then you're able to liquidate that complete asset when it comes to selling the business, right? So there's different ways that you can go to go into it. Like having investors is not a bad thing, but just be very clear about what that means. So then how do you own those companies? Like what are some of those types of companies? I think you should niche down. You should focus on one thing, find one product or service that you can sell and then niche down on that, become an expert at that and then leverage that product or service. So for example, Danielle Leslie has course from scratch. She has one product that's selling a course that teaches people how to build their own courses. She was able to 
generate $4 million in revenue just by having course from scratch in that one particular product at a price point that was able to continuously bring a substantial amount of revenue, a high ticket ticket price point into her business. So her course ranges for one nine or uh, what two thousand dollars to three thousand dollars depending on you know when you signed up whatever but that reoccurring revenue or that recurring revenue was able to get her to a four million dollar mark and she's continuing to grow and scale and she's never taken any outside venture that's one of those things where you can grow and leverage the company without taking outside venture and keeping ownership completely and then as i mentioned earlier one in a thousand entrepreneurs are more likely to become millionaires To obtain that financial freedom, according to Jeremiah Brown, who we had on the last episode. So check that out if you haven't already. So that is another way to obtain financial freedom. And what's interesting is even Bryce and Jeremy talked about this earlier, owning your customer. Like when you're on a platform, and this is very specific to influencers and people who are in that space and have personal brands. When you're on a platform and you're building out millions of followers, whether that be on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, you're leveraging those followers to essentially monetize them, right? So at some point, you're going to be able to monetize against your audience. But what if you owned those followers? Meaning, what if you had their email addresses or their phone numbers or whatever it is that you needed in order to get in in contact with them? So you had direct communication with them all the time. And you guys can see this in the algorithms. Like you can post something. I have 25,000 followers. I can post something and probably 10% or less of those people are going to see my content. But what if every single person had the opportunity to see that content, right? And so that's what I mean by owning your customer is owning the email addresses, owning the phone numbers, owning the content contact so that you can communicate directly to them and not depend on a social media platform in order to engage your customer. So I do understand that not everyone's an entrepreneur. So other ways that you can own assets without actually being an entrepreneur is investing in other people's companies. Like you can own a portion of that company through equity or owning real estate. That is a great way to own assets that are going to appreciate over time. You can own sneakers or clothing and you can resell them in a marketplace. That's a a form of ownership and you're able to leverage that. You can own domain names. I just talked to a friend of mine about this, about domain names a couple of days ago where you can resell them on a marketplace too. So there's just so many creative ways to have ownership, even if you're not an entrepreneur. You don't have to have a fully fledged venture backed business to be an entrepreneur. You can have a small medium business. And like I said, not everyone's an entrepreneur, which is totally fine. Just make sure that you are playing in the field of ownership in some way, shape or form. Super important. This is the plug. You know who's the plug. It's time to get caught up on the hottest in tech. Keep it locked, you heard. With Sequoia Blodgett. I see you, little mama. I launched my first company, 7 a.m. in 2014 after a long stint of working in the entertainment industry as a commercial and music video director. It was hard. Even though I was venture backed by one of the biggest VCs in the game, I still was so confused as to how to actually run, grow and scale the company. I didn't understand how to convert customers quickly and efficiently. I didn't understand which marketing tools to use and how to create sales funnels. I didn't understand staying niche in the beginning and not boiling the ocean. I didn't understand how to stay motivated during extreme times of loneliness and not getting the results I was expecting. After several years, we ended up closing the doors. I started studying hundreds of really successful entrepreneurs to find out how they not only kept the lights on, but were scaling rapidly. After officially walking away from my first company in 2016, several years later, I launched Commas, a virtual entrepreneurship resource center. Yes, we're actually a company. I built it to help you guys understand why raising capital too fast will actually hurt you, why you need a team around you to iterate quickly and stay sane, why your business has to stand out because so many people are doing the exact same thing. There are no new ideas and why it's important not to push your personal life to the back burner. Consider commas as your entrepreneurship resource guide so you can avoid making the same mistakes that I did. We cover all things from product to marketing to publicity and fundraising. 
You can learn more about Commas, the actual platform, by visiting commasTheSeries.com. You can also hit us up on our socials at Commas the Series. Until next week, it's your girl Sequoia, and I'm out. 